we would love to tell you more stories about what God's doing. But what I want to share with you, it's actually, it's been years that I've been wanting to talk about this because in all my years as a Christian, I've never heard a sermon on this topic. I've never preached a sermon on this topic. And I thought, oh, this is my chance. I think New Hope's going to let me choose what I want to say. Well, here it is. Um, yeah, this body of mine, it's in pretty decent shape considering how long it's been going continuously. But it's a very fragile ecosystem. If my heart were to stop beating for 10 minutes, I would be gone and with the Lord. Less than 10 minutes. If my brain stopped, I'd be gone a lot quicker than that. There's a zillion things that could go wrong with this body. And the same is true of yours too, but I didn't want to freak you out right at the beginning. <laughs> but the great news is that day after day and second after second, all of those thousands and thousands and thousands of things keep going right. I keep breathing and seeing and hearing, and so do you pretty much. And it's working most of the time pretty well so that we're all here. And that's a great thing. So how does that happen? Well, the Bible tells us why that can keep happening. The Bible says it really clearly in uh, one little phrase. Oh, we've got another PowerPoint. Can we pop up at the other PowerPoint? There it is. <laughs> and that phrase is found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, which says, The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. All things. Jesus, the risen Savior, is sustaining everything by his powerful word. Is that amazing or what? Constantly upholding everything. Everything that exists, everything that runs, everything that functions by his powerful word. And this shows us first the Lord's kindness in preserving us. The Greek word that's translated here, sustaining or upholding, is the Greek word pharaoh, which means to carry or to bear something. It's, it's used a lot of times in the New Testament for other stuff. Like when this lame guy's friends carried him to Jesus. This is the word, Pharaoh. It means you're, you're carrying something along, not just holding it, but you're carrying it somewhere in a direction. There's action there. It's purposeful control to move something somewhere. And interestingly, the Greek present tense is used, which means it's an ongoing, continuous action. It's not a once and done. It's not he put it in motion and it just kept happening while he did other stuff. He is continually involved in carrying everything along. Every molecule, every atom, every tree, every leaf, every ray of sunshine, it happens because Jesus is sustaining it. He's making it happen. He's actively involved in the work of providence, which is the theological word for this process. The word's not in the Bible anywhere, but the concept is everywhere because he's doing this stuff everywhere. And this providence of God is described in different words Again, in Colossians chapter 1, in him all things hold together. Paul writes, starting verse 16 of chapter 1, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. That kind of covers everything, right? <laughs> he, he, it's not just the visible stuff. He wanted to make sure you know it's the invisible stuff too. The invisible beings, all the invisible things you can't see. Yeah, that's included. Jesus is holding those up too. He created everything. They're all created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him, all things hold together. So, you know what that means. Without Jesus, what happens to all things? <laughs> all fall apart. In him, everything holds together. Every body, every person, every vehicle, every tree. It only stays together because Jesus is hanging on to it. And keeping it going. Is that astonishing or what? He is so actively involved. It's like, man, that's kind of mind-boggling. It really is. So if Jesus were to stop this continuous activity of upholding everything, 
everything else except God himself would instantly cease to exist. Not just fall apart, not just explode, but that's it. It only exists because he is upholding everything. And so God, get this, God is actively showing his kindness to every person, every animal, every plant, everything on earth, and in all the universe, whatever else is out there, is there because of God's kindness, holding it together. At this moment, all people on earth, all the Muslims, all the Hindus, all the Sikhs, all the Jains, all the Buddhists, all the atheists, all the animists, all the people who hate God, all the people who say there is no God, he's holding every one of us together. Isn't that amazing? He's very kind, isn't he? He is very, very kind. He is the one who graciously continues to give us life and the ability to think and the ability to make choices, what to believe, what to do, what to say, how to act. We can act any way we choose to, only because God is holding us together and giving the ability to make those choices. Wow. Elihu, thousands of years ago, the wise man at the end of the book of Job, after all of Job's comforters have said their piece, along comes, comes Elihu and he says, you guys don't get it. And everything he says is so on track. Well, I won't get into that. One of the on track things he says is, if he withdrew his spirit and breath, all humanity would perish together and mankind would return to the dust. That's probably one of the earliest books of the Bible that was written. He said it back then. If God didn't give us breath, we wouldn't be breathing. How easily we forget that amazing fact that humanity has known, at least the Hebrews knew, for thousands and thousands of years. It's not a new piece of information. It's not a secret. So the second aspect of providence that we see is the Lord's kindness in preserving an orderly world and an orderly universe. God is continually involved in all created things in such a way that he keeps them existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. So water keeps acting like water. H2O doesn't become H-O suddenly as you're about to drink it. And that's a really good thing. You know, molecules act the same way today as they did yesterday and 400 years ago, which is a really good thing. Photosynthesis continues working day after day. The water cycle, the clouds, the rain, the rivers, evaporation, the whole process it keeps working so well that it makes the news when it doesn't work well. Think about that. Think about it. If it was news every time the water cycle did something right, that's continuous everywhere all over the world with just a few painful exceptions, which should be reminding us of what an amazing job God is doing at keeping the whole system functioning all the time. It's big news when something goes wrong with that cycle because God is doing an amazing job all the time even when humanity is messing it up as we so often do. <laughs> but when there's a problem, it isn't because God missed something. <laughs> it's usually because we missed something. So everything that we know and experience as a natural process or call a natural phenomenon is the outworking of the Lord's kindness in preserving this world and the universe as we know it. So this invisible reality is the foundation for every branch of science and medicine. This is why we can gain knowledge and preserve knowledge that's useful about biology and chemistry and physics and botany, mathematics and astronomy. Every kind of engineering depends on God's providence continuing to uphold things the way that we know them. Every kind of music is only possible 
because the world, those processes function the same way. You pluck the string and it will do the same thing today it did yesterday. Praise God. <laughs> I'm really glad it works that way. It's only possible because Jesus' kindness is holding everything together. And Jesus himself described it this way. He said, he causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And the psalmist says, he makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. And again, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. When we think of the unfailing love of the Lord, there's a lot of things we can think about. But one I don't think about real often, which I could, is he's holding it all together. <laughs> he not just makes it happen, but he's holding it together. The heavens declare the glory of God. Those clouds only came out that way because God was feeling creative with it. He's doing a new arrangement that I've never seen before. It's so cool. And that's just one little bit of what he's doing here in one place that I can see. He's doing the same kind of stuff all over the world, all at the same time. And he never gets tired of doing it. Isn't that great? That is amazing. All nature is a powerful testimony of God's existence and his kindness. Part of the Apostle Paul's presentation of the gospel to the people in Leicester and Derby was he said, he has not left himself without testimony. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. God's doing that. But he doesn't force that awareness on anybody. He still provides life and breath to those who ignore him. Those that hate him. Those that just don't want to be bothered with God's stuff. God allows humans to invent all kinds of other explanations. He's given us the creativity and the breath and the minds to come up with all kinds of ways this could have happened that don't involve God. Isn't he merciful <laughs> to give people, even as they think up ways to deny his existence, he says, okay, you can keep thinking. You've got another couple of years to do this, and then we'll talk about it again. He gives the brain power and the voice to, to ignore him, to deny him, to do whatever. To do whatever we damn well please. And I use that word intentionally because that denial is in fact the road to eternal damnation. And that's the road that too many people are choosing. Some because they've heard it and didn't want it. Some because they just haven't heard it yet. But it's the ultimate rudeness to the most gracious gift giver who has ever existed. Imagine if I were keeping your life going moment by moment and you were just mean to me. <laughs> well, that's what much of humanity does with God day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour. And God continues his kindness. The sun still shines on the evil people. The physical processes still work for those that plan deception. For the thieves, for the murderers, for the rapists. God is gracious to still hold them together for a little bit longer. To give an opportunity to turn away from sin. To give an opportunity to realize, to see. We can praise him, ignore him, or curse him, but he still gives the gift. Both believers and unbelievers put fuel in their vehicles, and the vehicles run. <laughs> Isn't that something? You know? And, and some take it for granted. Some say, well, of course, it's a natural process. And we can be thankful, because we know who makes it work that way. There are so many Many, many ways God is showing his kindness every moment. This reality invites us to marvel, to wonder, not only at the natural, the, you know, the stars, the moon, the sun, 
the trees, the clouds, but even the, the man-made stuff only works because he's still upholding all of that stuff. How grateful ought we to be to a God like that? How much should that shape our outlook on life, on everything that's happening? To know, to live in humble gratitude to such an amazing gift giver. I want to mention one more facet of this before I zoom in on application, though. And that is the Lord's kindness to us in both usual and unusual ways. How does God's providence fit together with miracles? Well, providence is what we call God's usual ways of showing his kindness, of working in the world. That's the regular stuff. That's providence. And miracles, signs, wonders, they're God's unusual ways of working in the world to especially show his glory, to arouse awe and wonder. And among a lot of unreached peoples in Africa and Asia, in the movements that I'm interacting with, God is very often using these miracles, signs, wonders to get people's attention and bring a sudden openness to the gospel. As I interview leaders, I'll often ask them, what is it that's bringing so much openness to the gospel? Not all, but very many of them say, it's often a miracle. It's somebody prays, got, somebody got healed, and their whole family became open to the gospel. And that is a process as people see God's unique and surprising power. In one strongly Muslim area, a bunch of young men, guys between 15 and 25, they just went around, a couple of them, two by two, and asked the Muslim people who were known to be a pretty strong Muslim group, they asked, is there anything we can pray for? We're just going around praying for people. And you know what? This is cool. Muslims like to be prayed for. They don't mind who you are. They don't mind what your religion is. If you want to pray for them, that's cool. So if you know any Muslims, look for opportunities to ask them, can I pray for you? Is there anything in your life I can pray for? In decades and decades of interaction with Muslims, every time I've asked that question, they always say, yes, <laughs> yes. And so these young men were going around praying for people. And uh, you know what happened? Some folks got healed. And when the folks got healed, they came to faith. Now, usually Muslims come to faith over a long period of time. It takes a while to readjust their perspective. A different view of God, a different understanding of sin, a different view of humanity, a different view of heaven and hell. and every They've got a lot of the same words that mean a lot of slightly different things. So usually it takes weeks and weeks, sometimes months and months of studying God's word before a, a group of Muslims come to faith. But you know, when there are a couple studies in and, and they say, any, any problems you're experiencing? And somebody says, well, I've, you know, I'm really sick with this thing. And when God does a miracle, boom, they suddenly become open and they rearrange the whole order. Well, we were planning 50 studies, but right now we're going to jump to the Jesus study. Okay, and we'll come back to the other things later. After you've come to faith, committed your life, then we'll finish that stuff up. It's marvelous how God is using that. But, you know, it's interesting that sometimes Christians... Not paying attention or not remembering God's goodness, his providence, act like the only way we see God at work is in miracles. And so try to act as if everything's a miracle. You know, oh, that was a good coincidence, but we don't call it a coincidence. We call it a miracle, you know, or something is really, really good. So we call it a miracle like that's going to that's going to up the ante and make it sound better. You know, how can you disagree with the sweet ladies that say, I think every baby born is a miracle. Well, it's amazing. It's glorious. It's an unbelievable process. But, you know, 140 million babies are born every year. That's four every second. Every second. Like, while I'm saying this, a whole mess of babies just got born all around the world. And, you know, one doctor said for a baby to be born, 10,000 things have to go right. <laughs> And we praise God for all the times that those 10,000 things go right. And we grieve the times when some of those things don't go so right. But it's amazing. It's wonderful. We praise God for it. But if it happens four times a second, I don't think miracle is the right word for it. That, that's just messing with the word. 
I could tell you lots of stories of miracles. Mir- like miracle miracles, not just this was really cool, but miracle miracles and uh, healings, deliverances that are playing a role in bringing unreached peoples to faith. Animists, Muslims, Hindus. Uh, some of those stories are in the books. But right now I want to bring home an application. That is, if Jesus is continually sustaining all things by his powerful word, why is it so easy for us to overlook that fact? Why is it so easy for most people in the world to totally ignore that fact if it's reality? Well, have you ever driven in a thick fog or a whiteout? And you know there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that you can't see, and some of it is important, like the edge of the road, like the car in front of you, like any deer that happened to be there. And, and you know, they're actually in... There's a road here in this picture. <laughs> there's, there's a road here. We are in a fog. A huge cloud stands between humanity and seeing the reality of God's providence. The Bible calls it spiritual blindness. The Lord says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The Apostle John writes, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, now we're talking the miracles, they still would not believe in him. As Isaiah says, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So for us as believers... That fog has been partially lifted. And so we can catch some glimpses of God's glory. We can catch some glimpses of God's hand at work. Sometimes more, sometimes less, we realize. It's like driving through a patchy fog. We see some of it, and then some of it we're we're really missing. But any of us who were born in the USA have been born into a secularized worldview where basically we understand these things as natural processes. This is just how stuff runs. And, you know, God is an optional source of personal comfort. Now, we choose that source of personal comfort, but we agree with everybody else. Yeah, that's how, science, that's how physics works. That's how biology works. That's how astronomy works. And the basic assumption is it all just works. It doesn't matter if you care about God or not. That's a secular worldview. And I'm not saying we have to be preachy about all that stuff, but at the very least in our hearts, let's get beyond the fog and give praise to God. And occasionally mention that, you know, this stuff works because God makes it happen. People don't have to believe it. That's up to them. Our job is to speak the truth. And so remnants of that spiritual fog, that spiritual blindness can be described as strongholds. Things like unbelief, self-centeredness, idolatry, ungratefulness. And you can identify those strongholds in a place, in your life, in other people's lives. You can pray about those things. And if you're not aware of experiencing God's providence, His kindness to you day by day, moment by moment, you're missing out. There's some good stuff there. There's some fog to be cleared away so you can savor that kindness to you. It's available every moment. Any moment you happen to think about it, there are a million ways the Lord is holding your life together. It's amazing, all those opportunities to praise Him. If you're not experiencing a sense of safety and blessedness and constant care, you're being robbed of part of your inheritance. Because that's reality. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, He's with you. And even if you're not a believer... He is with you, giving you all those blessings. We all ought to be giving him praise, both believer and unbeliever. That's part of Paul's testimony when he preached the gospel was, God's given you all these good things. He's worthy of praise. And so we can break through that fog anytime, any place, with a grateful awareness that everything in our life, in our world, is the result of Jesus continually making it possible.
even when we're in pain, even when we're miserable, even when we see injustice or sin or brokenness, even when we look at today's news and see another mass murder because of hatred, God has given us the ability to read it, to understand it, to cry out to him and say, God, this is not right. Because he is upholding all things by his power. He has given humanity the ability to hate, to pick up guns, and to kill. And he has given us the ability to call out injustice, to call out hatred, to call out unrighteousness. And at the very least, to say, God, would you move? Would you act? Would you do something? And when we're in our personal worst moments, to say, God, have mercy. Have mercy on me. And when someone you love is in their worst moments, to say, God, please have mercy, O oh God. Would you work? Would you act? We can call out to him and respond to the world's brokenness in ways that honor him. And so, in a nutshell, we see that God is kind to all people, continuously giving us life and breath. And we can savor and we can delight in his kindness and live continuously in his love for us and for all people. We can break through the fog that blinds us to God's constant care and love. And we can consistently testify to all kinds of people of all kinds of views and systems and religions of God's kindness and love for them. Whether they want to believe it or not, that's up to them. Our job is to savor it and to share it. This is good stuff. Let's enjoy it. We proclaim it with our words and with our surprisingly thankful lives. Because, <laughs> you know, from the world's point of view, there is something wrong with people that are always thankful. <laughs> when stuff is going wrong, they still feel somehow blessed. They still somehow seem to be experiencing some supernatural infusion of something good. The world thinks that's weird. Well, praise God if we can be that kind of weird. And so as we delight in God's consistent, his providential demonstrations of kindness and power, we can also pray for his miraculous demonstrations of kindness and power. As we thank God for the doctors and pray he'll give them wisdom, we can still pray for miracles because God is happy to work both ways. He's doing both kinds all the time. They're both good. You just never know which one he's going to choose at any given time. You know the providence is always working. And you know the signs and wonders and miracles, sometimes they're happening too. It's all up to God who is so kind and so good and so loving to you and to me, and to everybody. So every time you take a breath, you are literally receiving a gift from God. Every time you see anything, you are receiving a gift from God. Every time you hear anything, whether your ears are still working well, or you got a little gizmo that helps, that is all because of God's goodness to you. Any time you taste something, or feel something. That's another evidence of God's kindness to you at that moment. You are swimming day by day and moment by moment in an ocean of God's blessing. Wow. Opportunities to thank him, to praise him, to give him glory. To take it in all at once would be totally overwhelming. <laughs> And so you can take it in whatever size doses work for you at any moment. You can take big doses until you are just about overwhelmed. Or you can take it in little doses, just bite size. Wow, that's good. Or you can just be thankful as you're so busy with other things, you're not actively thinking about those incredible blessings that you're experiencing. Whatever size dose works for you at any given time, God is making it all available. You can swim in the ocean or you can just... Enjoy it as you're going on your way. Wow. So let's take a moment now, just for each one of us in our own mind and heart, to invite God to open our spiritual eyes, 
to see more of his providential care, whether it be in nature, in science, in your own body functioning, in your ability to know him as the source of all stuff. Just take a moment. You and Jesus talk about this. What does he want to say to you? What do you want to say to him? And I'll be quiet for a minute. 